Welcome to the Gay Buddhist Forum, where teachers from all schools of Buddhism offer their perspectives on the Dharma and its application in modern times, especially for LGBTQI audiences. These talks are offered freely to the world and made possible by appreciative listeners. If you would like to support our efforts to share the Dharma with underserved audiences, please visit gaybuddhist.org. There you can donate, find a list of upcoming speakers, or enjoy many hundreds of these recorded talks dating back to 1996. Well, good morning, this, and welcome to the Gay Buddhist Fellowship once again. So we'll uh, go ahead and introduce our speaker today. Uh, Rene Rivera is a leader and bridge builder working and learning in all the spaces in between race, gender, and other perceived binaries as a queer, mixed-race, trans man. Rene has been a student of the Dharma since 2004 and has been a part of the East Bay Meditation Center Alphabet Sangha since 2008. He has participated in the Commit to Dharma and Practice in Action programs at EBMC and the Community Dharma Leaders Program at Spirit Rock. Renee is a community teacher at EBMC and also offers meditation and mindfulness instruction at other centers such as Spirit Rock Meditation Center, SF Dharma Collective, and others with a particular focus on offering the Dharma to QTPOC folks. So welcome to Renee. Thank you so much for having me. I just want to check in as I'm starting to make sure that you can all hear me okay. You can give me like a thumbs up. Great. I've seen a lot of thumbs. Excellent. And I'll take a moment to um, send blessings to whatever devas and deities govern the internet and telecommunications and ask for um, their beneficence over this next 45 minutes <laughs> or so. Um, so happy pride, everyone. We are here on June 28, 2020, exactly 51 years after the Stonewall, Stonewall Uprising began in the wee hours of the morning on June 28, 1969. Um, so it seems like a, um, a great day to come together. When I signed up for the slot, I imagined that we would be here meditating together in your space in the city as everyone else was gathering to celebrate in person. And now the world has completely changed and, you know, many celebrations are coming uh, are happening and uprisings are happening today and protests and rallies and um, different kinds of ways that we're all coming together in solidarity today. Um, and, and here we are coming together on the internet, so just recognizing this is such a different pride than I imagined it would be this year and maybe many of us imagined. Um, but I feel like I am feeling so much resonance with this day um, commemorating an uprising that happened 51 years ago. And I'm, I know I'm speaking to a group who may, of folks who maybe were there. <laughs> I was seven months old on that day. <laughs> Um, but I know a lot of you may have already been adults and um, may have a lot of history, so I feel kind of funny even talking about the history to you all, but I'll just speak from my own limited understanding. <laughs> um, and so I think no one quite knows what happened that, you know, early morning of that day, but we know that pretty quickly there were a number of folks who were assembled fighting back against police brutality at the Stonewall Inn in New York City. And among them were Sylvia Rivera, Puerto Rican trans woman, Marsha P. Johnson, a black trans person, um, and some other. There was also, um, we think, Stormy LeVay, a uh, black trans masculine person and um you know what we i think to the best that we know this was an uprising of trans people of color 
fighting back against just repeated police brutality. And 51 years later, you know, we know that they started a movement. And of course, we know there were other uprisings that happened here in San Francisco, the Compton cafeteria riots and all over. There were different uprisings and most of them led by trans women of color um, and other trans feminine folks. So we're celebrating this day today and, um, you know, we just have had this amazing, amazing historic Supreme Court decision saying that queer and trans people everywhere in the United States have the right to work and cannot be discriminated against based on our sexuality or sex or gender expression. And I, this is just, to me, feels like coming full circle from the beginning of our uprising in 1969. This is something that so many people have worked so hard for, and finally we have this. And um, so I feel it's a huge sense of celebration, and then also in the context of this broader uprising that we're in right now around Black Lives Matter, really recognizing the way that though our movement was really founded in the civil rights movement, led by trans women of color and other trans POC folks, um, that largely those who have really benefited in this movement have, have often been white, have often been male or, you know, white presenting, male presenting. And so I've just been reflecting for myself, even how I've been a beneficiary of a lot of these freedoms that have been fought for by, um, by black folks, by trans feminine folks, and maybe particularly by black trans women and, and just kind of feeling the complexity of this moment and, um, knowing that my freedoms have been won by those often who are more marginalized than I am. And, um, so looking at my own positionality as a white, often white passing mixed race person and someone who passes for male um, I, and ident identify as transmasculine. I am the recipient of a lot of privilege and often that privilege, you know, was, was won by others with far greater hardship. So it's just like, yeah, so this kind of feels like a complex moment, this moment, this pride day. And so I want to explore today, you know, what this pride day means in the context of uprising repair and collective liberation. So, you know, and knowing that even as we, as we are here in our respective homes, <laughs> um, coming together that other folks are gathering sometimes in person. I know there's a rally happening right now over at the African American, um, Art and Culture Complex on Fulton Street, the uh, Marsha P. Johnson Solidarity Rally. So, as we're gathering, they're also gathering to remember the black trans woman who really started the uprising in, um, 51 years ago. So connecting with, you know, I feel like I want to connect with that, be in solidarity with people everywhere who are taking this day to really recognize the contribution to our movement of black trans women, trans women, trans women in general, um, trans feminine folks of color. And I wanted to take a moment right at the beginning, actually, to recognize that for all that we have won, all the freedoms that we have won, that trans women of color are still being killed in our country in really disproportionate numbers. And I wanted to take a moment as we've been bringing in, I think many of us have been bringing in the names of so many black folks who've been murdered by the police and just in our um, in all the ways that white supremacy is impacting their lives. I wanted to also take a moment just to actually read the names of trans folks who have been murdered just this year in 2020. We know, and just the ones we know of, 
which are 16 people, most of them trans women of color. So I'm just going to take a moment to read their names and to ring the bell. And so I invite us just to, you know, just take a moment almost as a meditation to recognize and remember just these folks who've been lost so far this year. Dustin Parker. Nulisa Luciano Ruiz. Yampi Mendez Arocho. Monica Diamond. Lexi. Johanna Metzger. Serena Angelique Velasquez Ramos. Lela Aleas Sanchez. Penelope Diaz Ramirez. Nina Pop. Hille J. O'Regan. Tony McCade. McDade. Tony McDade. Dominique Remy Fells. Rhea Milton. Jane Thompson. Selena Reyes Hernandez. Martin Luther King said that an injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. I think one thing I've been reflecting on is the way that my awareness of the freedom or injustice or, you know, converse injustice that is the condition of particularly trans women of color in this country is a reflection on my own freedom. Like, um, I think another Martin Luther King quote is saying, you know, I will not be free until you are free, you know, and, you know, I'm paraphrasing, paraphrasing, (laughs) um, and you will not be free until I am free. And so just really reflecting on, um, you know, how do we move towards a collective liberation that really is, has at heart the liberation of all of us and in all of our webs of relationships that include Black folks that include trans folks, trans feminine in particular, and um, black women of color. You know, knowing this, like the Supreme Court decision, will definitely benefit me. You know, as a trans queer, you know, presenting white passing person, I will definitely have more protections in my employment and. You know, I'm someone who's always been able to get a job and recognizing that those employment protections 
when you can't get a job in the first place aren't might not contribute as much to your freedom and just like recognizing the lived experience often of trans women of color um, who often um, not only end up murdered but also end up incarcerated because the only way means they have to make money is often in sex work and other illegal um, forms of employment where they're much more likely to then end up arrested, end up in jail, and the, and the conditions are truly horrible for trans women in prison. That's maybe a whole other talk. Um, I've certainly learned a lot from the work of the um, Transgender Intersex Justice Project, TGIJP, just doing amazing work here in the Bay Area supporting trans women of color and particularly incarcerated trans women of color. Um, So just making the connection also with the... um, with the Dharma, which we're also here to talk about. <laughs> um, one of the um, really foundational suttas in my, as I have been exploring the Dharma, is the Satipatthana Sutta, the Four Foundations of Mindfulness. And um, I'm not sure if folks are familiar with the, the commentary by Venerable Analio. This is like one of my core texts that I keep coming back to. and. Um, There's a piece of this sutta, it's very long, I won't go into the whole thing, but I think just to review the four foundations of mindfulness, the mindfulness of the body, mindfulness of feelings or feeling tone or vedna, the third being mindfulness of the mind, and then the fourth is mindfulness of dhammas or mindfulness of the dharma, the way things are, but also many of the... um, ways that the teachings have come to us. So mindfulness of the teachings and how they're impacting our experience. So there's a, within the sutta, there's kind of a refrain, you know, like the chorus that comes in over and over again. And the first part of that refrain is, um, I'll just read it from the, it's the first, it's repeated like, I don't know, 20 times or something in the sutta. When it first appears, it reads, just the first sentence is, in this way, in regard to the body, he, she, they abides contemplating the body internally, or he, she, they abides contemplating the body externally or he, she, they abides contemplating the body both internally and externally. And when I first came across this, it just really struck me. I'd already been practicing for some years in the Theravada lineage and had always kind of received the teachings as, you know, like what you hear about the Buddha saying that you're um, just the investigating this body is what um, is like what we're invited to do in this path in the Dharma, to investigate our own experience. And then here was in this really foundational text about what mindfulness is. Sati is mindfulness. The Satipatthana Sutta is also called the direct path the, to enlightenment um, through our mindfulness. And So in this text, here in this text, it's so foundational, the Buddha is pointing to us bringing the mindfulness to our own experience or practicing internally, and also bringing our mindfulness to the experience of others, practicing externally. And then this piece about practicing both internally and externally was the thing that really blew my mind when I first encountered it and the thing that I keep coming back to over and over again. What does the Buddha mean to say that we're practicing mindfulness both internally and externally? Um, I just think this is so interesting. And I and um in this commentary there's a lot of like investigation of what this might mean. But I just want to like share some of how it 
what it means to me. Um, and definitely the Venerable Anali is, is saying this is pointing to uh, um, mindfulness of one's own experience, mindfulness of the experience of others. And then this, this internal and external is like, he kind of speculates, but it's a little bit hard to say what that means. Does it mean just toggling back and forth between my experience and your experience? Um, or my perception of your experience would be more accurate. Um, I wonder if it's not actually pointing to a sense of collective experience. So you could say I'm bringing mindfulness to myself, mindfulness to others, and then mindfulness to our collective experience. Um, so it could be like I, you, we. And I think this idea of operating from a collective sense of we is something that's quite common in other cultures, but is not particularly common here in the West. And so um, I sort of see as this teaching came to the West that we kind of dropped off the you and the we part and really just focused on the I part, even though I know this whole practice is not supposed to be about I. <laughs> um, and at the same time, there's a way, I think, and I just speak to the to the Theravada tradition that I have practiced in that we're so focused on, on bringing all of our mindful attention to our own experience. And one of the things that Analia doesn't bring up in this commentary, I think is really interesting is he doesn't talk about empathy. So I think the other thing that this, this teaching is potentially pointing to is an experience of empathy for others, for the experience of others. And um, just to go a little bit further into the sutta and the way that the, this refrain is kind of interacting with the rest of the sutta. So there's, you know, it says we're talking about mindfulness of the body and then feelings and then mind. So just interesting to say, what is it to be mindfulness of my own mind, the mindfulness of the mind of another, and mindfulness of both um, my own mind and another's mind at the same time? Like, that's just really in, kind of mind-blowing. And Analia does say, oh, is he talking about mind reading here? Is that what the Buddha's referring to? Because certainly we knew that the Buddha, you know, had really vast mental capacities. Um, but sort of saying, no, that's probably not what's being meant for most people. So like one of the dhammas, so then the, the fourth one is the sort of mindfulness of dhammas. So one of them is, is the Four Noble Truths is one of those dhammas. Um, so the Buddha says, again, monks, in regard to dhammas, he, she, they abides contemplating dhammas in terms of the Four Noble Truths. How does he, she, they, in regard to dhammas, abide contemplating dhammas in terms of the Four Noble Truths? Here, they know as it really is, this is dukkha. They know as it really is, this is the arising of dukkha. They know as it really is, this is the cessation of dukkha. They know as it really is, this is the way leading to the cessation of dukkha. And then we come back to the refrain. So it, the, it goes on in this way, in regard to dhammas, they abide contemplating dhammas internally. They abide contemplating dhammas externally. They abide contemplating dhammas internally and externally. So just thinking about that, that this is just contemplating the nature of suffering you know, the nature of suffering is universal, but we're to bring our mindfulness to our own experience of suffering, to the suffering of others, and to perhaps a sense of collective suffering. So it's just a really interesting, um, to me, actually pretty revolutionary approach to mindfulness, that we might bring our mindfulness into the collective. So I think one of the things that points to for me is how am I un how am I bringing discernment to the ways that my experience actually differs from other the experience of others, and one of the ways that I've been thinking about this is just this question of privilege. Um, knowing that's a place of like a lot of difference, and um, and my own positionality puts me with less privilege than some, you know, less privilege than someone who's maybe a white cis man, but also more privileged than 
a person who has brown or black skin more privilege in some ways than someone who appears feminine, you know, as I, as I appear masculine. So just knowing, okay, I'm, I'm somewhere in the middle. Um, one place where I got like a real insight around this experience of privilege was actually riding my bike. So I, um, I'm a big bicyclist. I spent many, many, um, hours on my bike and it's a place of practice for me. And, um, I remember one day I was riding, um, I was up in Sassoon County and it was just like one of those glorious days. It was beautiful. And I was like, I felt so strong and I was riding on the flat road and, and, um, I was like, wow, I feel so good. I feel so strong. I'm going so fast. Like I, I am like such a strong cyclist. This is awesome. And then I was realizing, oh, I guess I can't feel the wind at all right now. Like it was a windy day. And in that moment, it felt just like the wind felt calm. And I realized that the reason I couldn't feel the wind is because I had a really great tailwind. You know, so probably let's say it was a go about a 20 mile an hour wind. And I just happened to be right going right you know, out of the wind. So I was probably going 20 miles an hour and it just felt easy. It felt like I couldn't see in the moment without like bringing my discernment to it that the reason I was going so fast was the wind was behind me and pushing me. Um, it just felt like this is me. I'm so great. <laughs> and um if I'd been going the other direction into the headwind, of course, it would feel very, very different. <laughs> I would be really struggling. I would be like feeling like I was going up a 10% grade. Um, but it was just perfectly positioned to push me along and I couldn't even feel it. Um, so I feel like privilege is like that. It's really hard to feel when it's behind us pushing us along. And it's really easy to see and feel the nature of it when we're pushing into it like that headwind. So it's a place where it feels really important to me to bring my mindfulness to the experience of others who are different than I am to actually really start to understand the nature of that wind. You know, if I'm only feeling it with the wind behind me, I don't know even know how, I don't even know the wind is happening, let alone how fast it is or, how hard it is or whether it's like uh, picking up the grit and blowing it into my eyes. You know, there's always little textural qualities to the wind, but I'm not going to feel them if it's behind me. And if I'm moving into it, then I would really feel it. And just knowing that that's kind of like the experience uh, based on where we are, our positionality in rel relative to whiteness and white supremacy in this country is that kind of like whether the winds behind us are against us. Another great analogy I heard from someone else, and I can't even remember where I heard it now, was like thinking about our the world that we live in kind of like a video game. And what if, I don't know, maybe you all haven't played video games. <laughs> it's been a long time for me. But, you know, in video games, there's all these levels. You might start on level one and go up to level nine, and you have to make it through all the levels. But the analogy is like the way our world works is depending on your how you're born, you know, male, white, black, cisgendered, transgendered. You actually kind of get born into a different level in the video game. And if you're a white straight man, basically you live your whole life on level one, <laughs> you know, the easiest level. And if you're a black you know, maybe you're a black woman, I might be on level four. If you're a black lesbian, you might be on level five or six. If you're a black trans woman, you'd be operating your whole life on level nine. And it just was like, it's like a simple analogy, but it was like, it really um, stuck with me as a way of just understanding, yeah, we're living in one world with one set of conditions, but where we stand in it is going to have us operating on really different sets of condition. So it just comes back to me, for me, of this, you know, again, this idea of bringing my mindfulness to both my own experience, the experience of others, and some sense of trying to develop a sense of collective 
experience across really different our really different conditions. Um, and so that is one of the reasons why it feels really important to me to understand the experience of black trans women, because I feel that understanding the experience of those who are most marginalized within our system of white supremacy is going to really help me understand the actual conditions that I live in. And for me, come, you know, working for my own freedom is not really meaningful without working for the collective freedom. So I am um, ultimately working for my freedom is working for the freedom of the most marginalized. And, um, and I do think that this piece about bringing empathy across different experience is one of the ways that we develop this sense of um, of the internal and external. It is, I feel like empathy kind of describes this internal, I'm both feeling the experience of other another as I'm feeling myself. And so it's is a way in a way, I think part of what's being pointed to in this place where we talk about the mindfulness that is both internal and external at the same time. And sometimes I think of white supremacy actually as a cultural form of narcissism. And narcissism is interesting because it's not necessarily good or bad in, in an individual, the difference between a kind of healthy adult narcissism and uh, maladaptive narcissism is actually empathy. It's one of the biggest differences. So many uh, like healthy adult narcissists as well as maladaptive, destructive narcissists, you know, are, can both be incredibly creative, very decisive people who get things done. A lot of the things that our culture really values, but the maladaptive narcissist doesn't have any empathy, isn't able to experience any experience but their own. And that's kind of that, you know, like that rugged individualism or just the way that um, white supremacy says certain people are better than others and don't really have to look outside themselves to be empath empath empathetic with those that are different than themselves. So I've been, for me, I really feel that cultivating empathy is just an important part of my practice. And, you know, just bringing back to this, to this experience of how am I cultivating empathy with trans women of color? You know, really part of that is just relationships with people in my life. Some of that is supporting organizations like TGIJP. Um, you know, just learning more about the lives of Black trans women. I highly recommend um, the movie Major that's about Miss Major Griffin Gracie. Also, the life, the death and life of Martha P. Johnson. And there's been other films about Martha P. Johnson. So just learning more about the, about the specific lives of people who've had an impact on my own life. I was listening recently to a Dharma talk by Lama Rod Owens. I don't know if you all are familiar with him. He's just got a new book out called Love and Rage. Black gay lama in the Tibetan tradition, and um, gotten to sit with him a few times. But he just has a new uh, podcast out. It's the podcast is called Irresistible, and he's talking about his book. And one of the things he says in this podcast that just has been like ringing in my mind is he asks the question, "Can we love racism?" And of course, it's very different for me, you know, as a light skinned person to say that versus him as a black person saying that. Um, and so I just really been asking that like question of myself. I think he's meaning a whole set of things by that. And he, it comes out of this conversation about sort of just accepting the conditions of our lives. And he's in dialogue with um, an interviewer and he says like, yeah, how can we ex accept the conditions of racism in our lives, essentially? But he says, I don't want to use the word acceptance. I want to use the word love. So he very deliberately uses the word love 
How can I love racism? And it just really, I don't know that I can totally explain what he means by that, but it was a very, like one of those questions that just dropped into the core of my being. What would it mean to me? And I really got kind of reflected on my relationship with um, my own shame, actually. What would it mean to come to my own experience, the experience of shame that arises for me around knowing that I have received privileges that perhaps were won by those whose conditions were, you know, much more difficult than mine? How, how is it, you know, to be the recipient of that? Is there some shame that arises there? And can I turn towards that shame with as much kindness and compassion as possible. And kind of exploring the question, you know, is there actually something, um, you know, often we, shame is one of those emotions that we want to avoid at all costs. It's such a painful place to be. Um, but I've, it's an experience I've really been turning towards in my own life and doing some like really deep work in my own, um, particularly kind of my experience of unworthiness, which is a very core experience for me as someone who grew up with a lot of neglect. Um, I've been really just unpacking that experience on a personal level. Kind of being willing to sit enough with that experience of unworthiness to feel what's underneath it and to to be really like compassionate for the young person you know just small child that I was when I developed that as a survival strategy and recognizing that it was a smart survival strategy for this little kid who had parents who actually weren't caring you know they weren't caring for me and it was easier for me to think that there was, but that was because there was something wrong with me. Then it was for me to really look at the truth, which is that I was being cared for by adults who actually didn't have the capacity to care for me. And that was terrifying because that mean, meant I might not even survive if I really looked at that truth. The truth that maybe they, you know, like certainly there were times when I didn't get fed. There were times when I didn't, you know, know where I was going to sleep. There was just like times when things were really kind of catastrophic. And it was, but it was easier for me to think that there was something deeply wrong with me because that gave me some hope that maybe I could change my shape to be acceptable and be taken care of rather than confronting the truth of just my parents' incapacity. So like that's really speaking about shame on a very personal level. But I think um, you know, I want to bring some of these same questions to maybe a sense of collective shame that we have around, um, you know, just, I think in this group, we can say like, we're all lighter skinned, <laughs> masculine presenting folks or pretty homogenous group. Um, even though there's a lot of differences as well. And how is it to have been the beneficiary of you know, a lot of freedoms that were won by others, or won by black folks, by trans women, black trans women. Even the Supreme Court decision was won by a white trans woman. Um, you know, how is it? Is, is there some shame that arises around that? And is that shame maybe protecting us from something else? You know, is it maybe protecting us from an experience of really looking at the country that we live in and its history and the ways that so much of, you know, our, um, the success of some people have been based on what's been stolen from others. And, and maybe a sense that for me, I think it's a sense of heartbreak, just a sense of heartbreak at the conditions of the world that I live in and the sense of heartbreak at separation. Um, and and that brings up then actually a real desire for repair, a desire for wanting to reconnect. And so I just want to suggest that there's there also can be something that's wholesome in a sense of 
shame. And the Buddha talks about this in talking about um, uh, the Pali words are hiti and utipa. Um, so the Buddha called these two qualities the guardians of the world. And hiri, spelled H-I-R-I, is a sense of moral shame or a sense of like ethical integrity. So in like a negative sense, you could call it shame. In a more positive sense, you could call it ethics, ethical integrity, like our moral compass, our sense of what's right and wrong. And otapa, O-T-T-A-P-P-A, is a sense of moral fear. So like the fear of doing wrong. But we could also call that like thoughtfulness or scrup- scrupulousness or just having care for others, respecting the concerns and needs of others. So those were actually qualities that the Buddha identified as beautiful qualities. Like these are not negative qualities. These are really good qualities that we want to cultivate. And um, and I love that he calls them the guardians of the world. In some ways, they're the guardians of all of our relationships. This sense of not wanting to harm, of wanting to... Um, yeah, avoid harm to others. So it's just interesting to think of because we really don't often think of shame as a positive thing. Um, and here we are today on gay pride, <laughs> right? Pride is the opposite of shame. And so it seems kind of ironic to be exploring shame today, but I, it's just one that's really been up for me. And I, it's one that I've been kind of like wanting to reclaim, not to wallow in my shame, but to really like, experience it, get underneath it, and then say, how is this actually leading me back into relationship? You know, because shame can be very isolating. It can be very much a place where we are self-involved. But I think the Buddhist concept of shame actually turns us towards relationship to others. And um, how are we really taking care in our relationships? And to me, that also leads to the question of how are we working to repair our relationships? across difference so like how do we move beyond shame into repair and how are we invest this kind of getting back to these liberation collective liberation how are we really invested in the liberation of all including those who are really different from us how can we be doing that in some ways for ourselves really being accountable for ourselves for our, you know, sense of integrity, for our sense of relationship with ourself, for our sense of relationship with others. Um, I would call that kind of like a sense of right relationship. Um, so it's it like leads me to say, what's my stake in black led liberation? What's my stake in the Black Lives Matter movement? What's my stake in trans led liberation and liberation for black trans women? you know, in the work of, you know, group like the Transgender Internet Justice Project. So is it, am I actually being offered in these movements, in these liberation movements, an opportunity to find my own dignity, inner integrity, and that sense of right relationship? And I feel like these times that we're in are asking us in so many ways internally and externally and both to be really dismantling systems of repression, you know, and those internal systems of shame that like structure I was talking about of my own, like confronting my own sense of unworthiness, understanding why I would develop that and why also it's not true and having a chance to dismantle it. Like that's undoing an internal system of oppression. And then as we're taking action in so many different ways around Black Lives Matter, and I I saw the um, Gay Buddhist Fellowship Board just posted a statement around Black Lives Matter on Facebook, which is really resonating with, like, as we're taking action in the world to dismantle these systems of oppression externally, um, is there also something in here of just the work of collective liberation? the work of dismantling these systems wherever we find them, in our hearts, in our government, in uh, groups that we're a part of. Um, So I feel like this is what we're being called to in this time, is this liberation work. 
And I love just finding this core of this work in the Satipatthana Sutta of just inviting us to bring every aspect of our mindfulness to our internal experience, our external experience, and both internal and external. I think the Buddha was pointing to this work of collective liberation. Um, and if not, then I think we can claim it for that. So just kind of like, I mean, my question for myself, you know, is how am I moving into repair and right relationship? What are practices around repair for me? Um, apology is one that I've worked a lot on, and there's great resources on the internet around apology and just making that an everyday part of my life, asking for feedback. And when I have had an impact on someone, making really heartfelt apology. Um, there's also a lot around reparations. I'm not going to get, that's like a whole nother talk, but just thinking about reparations in different ways as an opportunity for repair, which is what that word means. Um, and sometimes for me, that can just be supporting different organizations. Another one that I like to support is the Segurate Land Trust. They have the Shumi Land Tax. It's a way to financially give back to the indigenous peoples of this land that we live in the Bay Area, the Ohlone people, to be able to have self-determination and to own their own land. Um, so, so many opportunities. And it's really just, I think, a question for us all to sit with. And... Um, and I wouldn't have an answer for what's right for you, but I just keep holding the question for myself. So inviting you into that collective liberation practice. Thank you so much for listening today. Thank you so much for your, um, <clears throat> for touching on so many issues of personal and collective um, suffering at the moment and, and and opportunities for moving forward um i i hope we get to have a discussion at some point about sort of taking it beyond the personal and what what can we do collect as a collective as a sangha and i think that that's sort of an important question for us to focus on maybe next week when we have our small group discussions or something um but thank you so much for your for your talk today. Um, so we're kind of at the end of our time. Do we have some announcements, please? Jeff. Uh, thank you for a great talk, Renee. That was really moving. Um, lots to think about. Uh, I have some good news. The website should be back up by Tuesday. Uh, and uh, I'm excited about that. Uh, in the meantime, you can, uh, if you would like to make an offering to the Donna uh, account, you can go to PayPal and the email again is jl at jocular.net. Is that right, Cass? Yes, jl at jocular. Dot net. So I just put it in a U L A R. Yeah. I just put it in the you know, chat window. Uh, or you can mail it to our, our PO box. The other thing is, uh, Wednesday night is GBF live and we have a discussion group from 7.30 to 9. The first 30 minutes are meditation. So if you can join us for part or all of that. It's a nice group. And next week is, as I mentioned, open discussion. Um, uh, and we'll be back here at the normal time, 1030. Um, any other announcements? No other announcements, then I will. Yes. Yes, Ed. Yes. Um, I wanted to recommend very highly a PBS um, piece this last week called Pride Land. And it is the, uh, the journey of a young gay man through the South. 
to discover how it is to be gay in the South. And I am putting, I'm going to put it on chat, how you can uh, access it uh, through from Google. Um, and I think if you, if you miss, if you saw it, you probably are delighted. And if you haven't seen it, do see it. Great. Pride land. Is that right? Pride land. Yeah. Thank Pride you. land. Yeah. I just I like put it to, on the chat. Oh. If you're interested, that's where it is. I'd like to recommend a movie on the Frameline Festival that's available for streaming this, um, weekend called, uh, Breaking Fast about a gay Muslim doctor in West Hollywood as he maneuvers um, into a new relationship. It was quite interesting and uh, well-written and well-produced and well-acted. So I recommend that. Great. I think there's also a documentary about Hank Wilson, um, who did uh, incredible work uh, for homeless people in uh, the Tenderloin, uh, Mm -hmm. ran a hotel for people. Um, there's also a documentary on Netflix about Marsha P. Johnson. It's very interesting. Check out Frameline. Essentially, one thing to do is check out Frameline. Um, they're having an online festival um, this year. So, Renee, would you, uh, I'll turn it over to you for the dedication of merit. Thank you. Great. And I put a few links in the chat as well. Thank you. Um, yeah. So just taking a moment to breathe together. May the merit and the benefit of our practice together today, our inquiry, May all this merit go to benefit trans people of color, trans women, black trans women, and all those who struggle under multiple systems of oppression. In particular, may any trans folks who are incarcerated or in institutions or otherwise have their freedoms limited, may they particularly benefit from the merit of our practice today. May all trans folks, black folks, trans feminine folks, trans folks of color, May they all, wherever they are, be safe and protected from harm. May they be happy and no joy. May they be healthy in mind, body, spirit. May they receive all the care that they need. May they find peace and ease, well-being. May they be held in love, kindness, and compassion. May they find freedom and liberation. May all beings everywhere be free. Thank you so much, Renee. So yeah, your Donna is greatly appreciated. Uh, it does, um, a lot of it does go to, um, producing the newsletter, which, um, goes largely to in- incarcerated individuals. So keep that in mind as you, um, contemplate making a donation today. Thank you so much for having me today. Really appreciate getting to celebrate Pride with you all today. So, I really appreciate you being yeah. here on Pride. Thank you so much for Thank you for nice Yeah. Time. Yes, it's a delight to me to be here with you all on Pride. So, happy Pride, everyone. Happy Pride. Happy Pride, everybody. Happy Pride. Have a wonderful rest of your day. You too. You too.
Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Gay Buddhist Forum. If you would like to hear several new talks per month and be notified of upcoming speakers so you can participate live, please subscribe to this podcast, like us on Facebook, and join our mailing list by visiting gaybuddhist.org.